Ora, muito boa tarde para todos, desde a Califórnia, desde o Portuguese Beyond Borders Institute, PBB, da Universidade Estadual da Califórnia, em Fresno. Good afternoon, everyone. Good, those of you following us here in California, just turned to 12 o'clock, so it is officially a good afternoon. On behalf of the Portuguese Beyond Borders Institute, that's PBBI, from California State University, Fresno, welcome to our session. Welcome to our students who are joining us, and some will be joining us in just a bit as well. And welcome to those who are following us uh, on our uh, social media pages, and thanks to the 23 different groups um, that are related to the Portuguese American community throughout North America who have agreed to carry uh, this presentation live as well. All of our presentations are also recorded and are part of the Portuguese Beyond Borders Institute uh, archive at the library, our digital archi archive at Fresno State Library, as well as, of course, our YouTube channel. So we're very happy to, um, once again, welcome each and every one of you, and a special welcome to those, and I know there's quite a few people following us in different parts of California and different parts of the United States as well, some folks from Canada who have sent me emails and some also from mainland Portugal and from the archipelagos of the Azores and Madeira, and a few friends that said they would be joining us in southern Brazil as well. So our presentation is in English, um, and uh, it is uh, titled, as you can see, The Strategic Relevance of the Azores. Um, very happy to have uh, this young man here with us today, all the way from mainland Portugal. A uh, brief uh, intro, and that is Tumé Ribeiro Gomes, was born in, um, and I'm going to be uh, very uh, subjective here, in the most beautiful island, the Azores, uh, for obvious reasons for me, uh, and that is the island of Terceira Azores, uh, but it is, they're all beautiful. Uh, he studied in Lisbon, having obtained uh, his Bachelor of Arts in Political Science and International Relations at the uh, Universidade Nova uh, in Lisbon, and his Master of Arts is in Governance, Leadership, and Democracy Studies at uh, the Catholic University, Universidade Católica in Portugal. Currently, Tomé is um, a, a candidate for his working on his uh, PhD dissertation, we say here, thesis, we say in Portugal. It's uh, the same project. It is a, um, it's something that takes a lot to, to, to do, and um, uh, I'm sure he's a brilliant student, student, so he will be doing very, very well. And um, his, uh, his PhD is on the strategic relevance and geopolitics of the archipelago of the Azores in the post-Cold War um, for the PhD program in history, security studies, and defense at uh, IST, ISCT, uh, IUL in Portugal. Tumé, bem-vindo, welcome. Uh, it's a pleasure to have you here, and uh, we're very looking forward to this uh, wonderful talk. Thank you so much, Denise, and thank you for the, the invitation. I'm very, very happy to be here with you, and very glad also to hear that we've got people from all over the world uh, listening, in, listening in. So, as you said, we're going to be discussing the strategic relevance of the Azores, and... What I'm, what I'm bringing you here is uh, a case study, you could say. But before we get into that, and you just said that it's, the Azores are beautiful. I didn't want you to think that it's just st strategically relevant. So it's also beautiful. And here you have, take a minute to appreciate Lagoa do Fogo in uh, San Miguel Island. Um, you can and should visit. So the Azores, for those of you who do not know, we're a mid-Atlantic, this is a mid-Atlantic archipelago. It's about, so we've got here some distances. It's about 2000 miles from New York and 870 miles from mainland Portugal. So from Europe. And the span of the Azores is about three, 370 miles. And as you can see, the latitude is quite high. The Azores are warm because we have the uh, hot currents, the warm currents of the Gulf of uh, the Gulf Current from the Gulf of Mexico, which which um, which make it very 
we have a very low, um, very small uh, span uh, of temperatures. So it's never very cold, never very uh, warm. And strategically, you can start to appreciate that this is um, an intermediate zone. So this is between continents. It's between, on the one hand, the Americas, specifically North America, and on the other hand, Europe and North Africa as well. And I've got here uh, Madeiros Ferreira, José Madeiros Ferreira. He's from São Miguel, so he's Azorian. He was also uh, Minister for Foreign Affairs uh, when our democracy was just beginning, so in, 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 in 75, after the Carnation Revolution. And he had this very, um, I think, useful lens for us to think about the strategic relevance of the Azores, which is it's either a frontier or a bridge. So the Azores are going to be either a frontier between America and Europe, or they're going to be a bridge. He uses the term articulation, an articulation function. So it's going to be a hinge between the two continents. But first, we need to answer the theoretical question of what is strategy, because we're talking about strategic relevance. And to answer this question in a very practical way, we can tell a story of a US president who didn't come from uh, very intellectual circles. So he was a, an actor, a Hollywood actor, uh, as you as you well know. Also came from, from uh, radio as well, uh, Denise, as well as you. And um, he arrives at the presidency and there's this story that a, a White House staffer uh, tells us where in the first National Security uh, Council uh, meeting, he uh, has all the chiefs of staff come in and tell him and report to him, well, the, the, the Soviets have more tanks than us. The Soviets have more submarines than us. The Soviets have more ships, surface ships than us. And at a certain point, uh, Ronald Reagan uh, turns to uh, Bill Casey, the CIA uh, director, and asks him, Bill, what do we have more of? And he says, money. And Reagan says, fine, we'll use that. And the, the staffer, uh, uh, Stephen Holper, says, from then on, we knew what we're, we were doing. We knew the direction that US foreign policy and strategy was going to take vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, the, the Soviet Union. So this is a very practical uh, question put by, by, by Reagan, but we can theorize what's behind it, because I think this is, this is good strategy, uh, good strategic decision-making that he's making here. And it's anchored in this um, formula that Arthur Leake is an American, has to explain strategy. So he says strategy equals ends plus ways plus means. So ends, objectives, what we want to achieve as a, as a state, as a country, means what is at our disposal. So the question, what do we have more of in, in the story? And then the ways in which these means will be converted into the ends that we're pursuing. And of course, the objectives have to be defined in view of the means that you have to achieve them. You, you cannot have um, either too vague objectives or too ambitious objectives, which are completely out of whack with the means that you have. Then we have Lawrence Friedman here uh, stating quite pithily, strategy is the art of creating power. And this is done, this uh, decision-making, strategic decision-making is done always in an environment which is characterized by, by what Jarger uh, says is VUCA. So it's volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity. So these four features are always present. And I promise all of this will be will come in handy when we're discussing um, the Azores. Then we have Lutvak, who says that strategy is adversarial, and therefore it's paradoxical. So strategy, there's also an enemy. There's always an enemy. There's always an adversary. There's always someone who can counteract your actions. So in Lutvak's uh, image, you can have a very good road to get from point A to point B. But if your enemy, if your adversary knows that this is a good road, then 
I think it's quite likely that he'll put up some barriers or uh, 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 an ambush or some kind of trap. So maybe you're better off taking the worse road than the better road. Then uh, to finalize, we have Jeremy Black, who says that strategy is not a document, but a practice. So there are strategic documents, which bureaucracies use to plan uh, long-term policy. But we're looking here at how strategy uh, is constituted through practice. So when we look back at history, which we will be doing now, we can see strategic decision-making and we can see strategic principles at play. And so without further ado, we're going to plunge into 1909, the Azores in 1909, for a very, uh, I think, unknown, but should be better known, trip to the Azores by this man. So this is President Theodore Roosevelt, the 26th uh, US president. And at the time, presidents didn't used to leave the US. He was the first president to leave the US while in office. He went to Panama because the Panama Canal is, is his project. And after he completed the, the presidency, so his, his second term, he went on an African safari, an African expedition. He wanted to get out of the way for his successor, his chosen successor, who was uh, William Howard Theft. And so he crosses the Atlantic to go to Africa. And as he's crossing the Atlantic on a passenger liner, he stops by the Azores and he visits two islands. He visits Fayal, uh, the city of Horta in Fayal, and Ponta Delgada in the island of São Miguel. This is him in uh, São Miguel, in Ponta Delgada. And the wrinkle here is that he was not received by official Portuguese authorities. So the, the mayor comes to, 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 to see him. There's a lot of people uh, waving um, according to, to the sources, but there's no official uh, reception. And this is a question. Uh, why, why did he not get uh, as good a reception as he would get when about one year later, he went on a European tour where he was received as, as a king or as, a, uh, uh, as if with honors of state despite not being present anymore. And the answer to this riddle, so Carlos Guilherme Riley says that the regicide uh, had just happened in Portugal a few months before, so the king had been killed, and there was a lot of fear over Republican sympathies and sympathizers who might rally around the Republican cause with such a popular Republican president uh, being in, in Portugal. But another reason that I think is quite likely for, for the authorities not to want to receive Roosevelt and to, to give him um, a platform or to, to get him into the national media was that from, um, from, from, the, from at least uh, 1870, the UK, so uh, at the time Great Britain, would make sure that Portugal would not let any other power use the Azores. So anytime the government changed in Portugal, and there were a lot of governments in the last years of the monarchy, the Minister for Foreign Affairs of Great Britain would meet with the Minister for Foreign Affairs of Portugal, and he would ask him to get guarantee that no other power could use the Azores. So the Azores were reserved for Great Britain. So you can see here how the Azores were seen as strategic by the dominant power in the Atlantic at the time, which was Great Britain, not the US. So the US is, the economy is booming, but there's still the idea that the US is only concerned with the Americas. And Theodore adds the, 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 the Roosevelt corollary to the Monroe Doctrine. So the Monroe Doctrine said that the, 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 the Americas should be free from European influence, so from uh, colonialism. And then uh, Roosevelt, with the Roosevelt Corollary, after the Spanish-American War of 1898, said that the US could intervene to expel European powers from uh, Latin American uh, or Central American countries. So Theodore represented a very uh, engaged US, which was something that Great Britain wasn't that keen on because Great Britain 
uh, needed to control the seas to because of its empire. We, we're jumping forward nine years now, and we're in 1918. And there's another high-profile visit. This one is 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 more uh, more more known, which is this young man who's a cousin of Theodore Roosevelt, and you'll have recognized Franklin Delano Roosevelt. At the time, he was Assistant Secretary of the Navy, which was a post Theodore uh, had already uh, had al also uh, occupied. And Franklin Roosevelt in 18, in 1918, so First World War is ending, and he also visits the islands as Assistant Secretary of the Navy, and he visits Ponce Delgado, where, where there's a naval base. So the US, during the First World War, because the German submarines were really hammering US uh, commerce. They felt the need to have a station in the middle of the Atlantic from where they could conduct anti-submarine uh, operations, which they did from Ponte Delgada, and also to have a coal depot, because at the time, uh, ships were coal powered. So to have coal ready in, in the mid-Atlantic position to be able to refuel uh, their ships. The base was decommissioned in 1818, in 1919, sorry, because the US after the First World War quickly goes back to its more traditional isolationist position. So they're not interested in being that engaged uh, globally. And famously, they don't, um, they don't uh, uh, go into the, uh, to the League of Nations, which uh, President Wilson had uh, had set up it was his brainchild so we have here two high profile american visits to the azores at a time when the us is starting to see that it's got to engage with europe if uh, it doesn't want to 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 be severely restricted uh, in its actions at the same time it's still great britain who commands the sea lanes of the atlantic and so the azores are at this uh junction, this historic junction between the Great Britain still holding the baton of, of Atlantic uh, sea lanes and the US starting to, to engage. FDR's visit will be important later. We'll see, uh, we'll see it again. But what happens now in the interwar years is that the US disengages from global politics. And uh, of course, when the Second World War begins, the alarm, alarm bells uh, ring, but the US doesn't come into the war until Pearl Harbor at the end of, of 1941. But before then, even before then, after, especially after the fall of France to, to, to the Germans, to, to the Nazis, you have uh, a lot of worries that the Atlantic is about to become a very, very hot flashpoint in what been known as the Battle of the Atlantic. Churchill coined the phrase, Winston Churchill, so the Battle of the Atlantic, which is, again, the German submarines attempting to torpedo, to sink shipping. So Great Britain depended on American supplies, and the Germans, if they sank enough ships, more than the Great Britain and the US were able to replace, then Britain's lifeline will be cut and the path to an invasion of, of, of Great Britain would be much eased and, and the other theaters in North Africa, for example, would probably be uh, won by, by the Germans. So there was this very, uh, oh, and th there's also the fact that with the fall of France or with the conquest of France, Germany now, can have uh, submarine bases on France. So it's got very uh, reinforced, very well-defended submarine pens uh, in, uh, in the Bay of Biscay. And this is a very great hassle to, to American shipping. And the, the, the worries that start to appear in the, in the US press about the Azores being taken by the Germans are well funded. So Hitler himself helps to select base future bases for 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 Germany, and he selects the Azores. The, U, the Churchill and his military planners know this, so they also plan an invasion of the Azores before uh, uh, 
the Germans could get there. That's the idea. If the Germans have a coup de main where they try to, try to, to, to get the Azores, uh, we'll get there before them. The US, on the other hand, is, is starting to worry about this as well. So there's a lot of uh, articles in the media. And then it's they're amplified by uh, Franklin Roosevelt's fireside chats. So this is in 1940. And he says to the American people, analyze for yourselves the future of two other places, even nearer Germany, if the Nazis, Nazis won. The islands of the Azores, which still fly the flag of Portugal after five centuries. You and I think of them, think of, of, of sorry, you and I think of Hawaii as an outpost of defense in the Pacific, and yet the Azores are closer to our shores in the Atlantic than Hawaii is on the Pacific side. So very acute worry here and trying to start to prepare American public opinion for an aggression, an occupation, a takeover that the U.S. might be uh, might feel obliged to, to, to do towards the Azores. In another fireside chat, so this is May 1941, he says, the Azores and the Cape Verde Islands if occupied or controlled by Germany, would directly endanger the freedom of the Atlantic and our own American physical safety. Those islands would become bases for submarines, warships, airplanes, which could attack shipping in the South Atlantic, and they would be a springboard for an actual attack against the integrity and independence of Brazil and our neighboring republics. So there's a very acute sense here that the Azores are a frontier for the US. So in the concept of US hemisphere defense, if the Roosevelt corollary said that Europeans could not meddle in the Americas and the US would expel them if they did, now what we're seeing here in practice is Franklin Roosevelt saying publicly that they have to extend their, their, uh, their line of defense to the Azores. So it's a red line for them. But now the question is, what do you do about the Azores? Portugal was neutral. It achieved that neutrality. So this is Salazar. This is the dictator, Antonio de Oliveira Salazar. And he achieved this neutrality in the Second World War by giving something to each side, by trying to give arguments to each side, benefits to each side, to having Portugal out of the war. So while he was um, you know, sweet talking to Germans and, and selling them uh, Wolfram, which was very important material for, for the German war effort, at the same time, he needed to give something to the US and to, to the Allies, to, to Great Britain as well. And the Portuguese neutrality was useful because if Portugal entered the war on the Allied side, then Hitler might um, activate Operation Felix, which was the plan of invading um, the Iberian Peninsula. And Spain was also a very pro-Hitler dictator, uh, Francisco Franco. And if Portugal was, was lost, Gibraltar, the British Gibraltar would also be lost, and the Germans would e find it even easier to then gain access to the Azores and then launch attacks against the US and uh, Great Britain. So they were trying to get Portugal neutral. Uh, and despite there being war plans for a takeover of the Azores, the choice that is made is to try the diplomatic route. And this also fits, fits with our idea of strategy. Uh, there's a quote here from Lawrence Friedman, the realm of strategy is also one of bargaining and persuasion as well as threats and pressure. And the US is going to use both on, on, on Portugal. And we're going to, to see here uh, an instance of persuasion. So trying to, to, to use the carrot here rather than the stick. And this is a letter that FDR, um, uh, FDR writes to Salazar, personal letter, Dear Mr. Salazar, in July 1941, where FDR assures uh, Salazar that he, he wants Portugal to be neutral and he wants the well-being of the Azores. And he reminisces about his experience in the Azores, which we've, we've talked about in 1918, and how beautiful the Azores uh, were and how he found the Azorians very 
pro-American and how he found a friendship uh, there and very good, very, very much goodwill on the part of the Azorians. So he's trying to convince Salazar that for him, this is a personal matter. He's personally invested in, uh, in this. Obviously, the need to uh, assure Salazar in this way also um, betrays or uh, leaves implicit that there's a threat here. So the U.S. is concerned about the Azores, and if Salazar doesn't budge, might invade in order to keep the Germans out. So we have here a very clear uh, instance of uh, the Azores as, as a frontier. What ends up happening is that the Germans get completely um, bungled up in, in, in the Soviet Union, so they try to invade, they invade Russia, Operation Barbarossa, uh, which is seen as one of Hitler's biggest mistakes. They get completely um, bogged down in there and there's clearly no way for him to invade the Iberian Peninsula or even to take the Azores in a kind of lightning strike. So those worries are taken off the table. And there is time for diplomacy and they, uh, the British managed to convince uh, Salazar to let him to let them have uh, a, an airstrip in the side island in Laj. So this is in 1933, and this preserves Portuguese neutrality because Portugal had a very very old, from the 14th century alliance treaty with with England. So Salazar says that they're still neutral. They're doing this because of their obligations, their bilateral obligations. With uh, with Great Britain, and you know this flies. Germany uh, is not going to to respond for the reasons we've talked about. So this sticks. But then the British are leaving. Clearly, they're 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 leaving the the island after the Second World War uh, ends, and 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 they do. But the Americans are starting to think that it's very useful. It would be very useful to have a base in the Azores with a view to preparing the security order that's going to follow from World War II. So by now, it's getting clear that um, the Allies are going to win and the US are looking forward. So they're going to try to build uh, an international order, global order, which, got, which, got, which has got its cornerstone in the UN, the United Nations. And this is from the Atlantic Charter in 1941. But this is very, very different from the world that Salazar wants to, to live in. So Salazar is still looking backwards. So he's trying to find a world where he can still have his old-fashioned conservative dictatorship. And to maintain it, he wants to keep his relation with, with uh, Great Britain, his relations with Great Britain, which had served them in, in good stead. Um, because the British were very tolerant about empire, about the colonies. But some people uh, in Portugal, for, among Portuguese decision makers, start to understand that it's going to be the US that's going to lead the post-World uh, War II uh, world. Salazar has is a, is, is a lot of difficulty adapting to this idea. So this is about, this is one of the main things that you need in strategies. You need to be able to read the strategic environments because you need to be able to place your state in a position where it's going to benefit, where it's going to continue to exist, where security threats are, are, are seen off. However, what happens is that Salazar, even after uh, the war, is going to try to stick to Spain, which is also a dictatorship, and um, he always sees American presence, any American presence uh, in the Azores, as a threat to his uh, to, to his uh, regime, and as a, a foreign imposition upon upon Portugal. And then in forty three, as the British are leaving, there's a, a man who's George F. Cannon, he's the chargé d'affaires in, in Portugal, so there's no ambassador, he's, the, he's acting in lieu of, of, of an ambassador in Portugal, and he manages to find a solution to crack the Salazar problem. So to be able to have an American presence 
in the Azores after the, Brit the British leave, because uh, the Americans were using the Azores, so American air aircraft were using the Azores, but under the Aegis, under the, the, um, the legal framework of, of, the, of the British, but to have an autonomous presence in the Azores, he managed to find uh, the key to convincing Salazar to sign a, a deal with the Americans. And the key was East Timor. So on the other side of the world, there's this Portuguese colonial possession, East Timor, which was taken by Japan. So it had been occupied preventively by uh, um, uh, Dutch and Australian forces. But then the Japanese take over the entire island of Timor, including uh, East Timor. And obviously, for, for Salazar and for anyone, once Japan is defeated in the Pacific, the US are not going to return a colonial possession to the colonial masters of Portugal because they're very clearly ideologically against uh, colonial empires and colonialism. But Cannon, from a, a hint that Salazar drops about East Timor, Cannon understands that the US can offer to give Timor back to Portuguese sovereignty in exchange for having an airport in the island of Santa Maria. So there's one at Lages, at Terceira, as we've mentioned, but they need to uh, more, um, uh, they need to, to, to expand operations, so they need a new airport uh, in, in Santa Maria. And this works. So Salazar signs a deal, not with the, with the US, but with a civil company, a private company, which is Pan American. And there's military uh, personnel that go and, and build the, the airstrip, but they're, they're, but they're, um, they're not in uniform to keep up the pretense that this isn't, um, to keep up the pretense of Portuguese neutrality, because this is still during the war that this happens, 1944. Then later, after the war, the US are trying to remain in, uh, uh, in the Azores, because it's been very useful as a staging post, an Atlantic staging post, when taking our aircraft from the US to, to, to Europe and to North Africa. And the, the person who, oh, and just by the way, Cannon, he's going to be one of the great minds of uh, US foreign policy and strategy for the next uh, decades. He dies at 101 uh, years old at, uh, in uh, 2005, I think. And he writes the, the, the big documents, big US strategic document of the Cold War in, in 46. So it's an important feller. Here we have uh, Dean Aitchison. He, he's uh, um, under under Secretary of State. Later, he's going to be Secretary of State. And to convince Salazar to uh, sign a deal with the U.S. for a more permanent uh, U.S. presence, what he does is he manages to give a U.S. public guarantee of security to Portugal. So the US publicly state that they will act aggressively, if need be, using force to protect Portugal in case Portugal, uh, Portugal's sovereignty is, 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 is checkered by, by a third uh, country. And this includes the empire. So this is a, a tacit acknowledgement from the US that Portuguese colonial possessions will, will be intact uh, after the war, because again, the U.S. were very much uh, against colonialism. So this this gives Salazar a way of maintaining his empire after the Second World War into the the, the post-war uh, international uh, order. And so, what 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 happens during the Cold War is that as the U.S. Um, build up an international order which isn't global. So there's the global international order, which is based in the United Nations. Every, every state has a, has a seat. There's a veto power in the United States Security Council for the superpowers. So there's a, a distinction between small, medium, normal states and the superpowers, including the, the, the US. And Portugal has got to have a place not only in this global order, but also in the new order that is created to face 
the Soviet Union. So Marshall Plan, which is which is created against the, 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 the Soviet Union, well, Soviet countries are invited to receive aid from, from, from the Marshall Plan, economic aid from the Marshall Plan, but the, the USSR, the, the Soviet Union, is not going to let them uh, accept it, of course. So they create their own mirror image of, of the Marshall Plan. And there's also NATO, so the security um, in, uh, organization that's going to, to, to federate the, the, the West also against the, the USSR. And despite Salazar's conservative, authoritarian, uh, Catholic ideology, which was very much against US liberalism, Portugal has got to be in, in this order, in this security order, in this, in this international order, because of the Azores. And you can see here, so this is a, a kind of a, a timeline of, um, of these events and, and the Azores, so the, the, the role the Azores play in it. So with the Marshall Plan, Salazar accepts the Marshall Plan, but he doesn't even uh, ask for much in the first uh, round of economic aid because the idea is that it is not taking uh, charity from the US, okay? Then in 48, you have the Berlin airlift. So you have the Berlin blockade, the, 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 um, the Soviets uh, close off the roads to Berlin, try to, to strangle off um, the, the Western administered areas of Berlin. And the US response and the allied response is to airlift um, products, airlift supplies to, to Berlin. So this is Operation Vittles. And already, large, so because in 46, the, the Americans opt to shift their headquarters from Santa Maria, which becomes just a civil airport, to Laj. So Terceira Island, Laj Air Base. There's always a, uh, military personnel at Laj from, from then until, uh, until now, until today. And Laj already plays a very a sizable role in the Berlin airlift. So some of these supplies go through uh, Laj. Then the Berlin airlift convinces the, the, the US essentially to, to form NATO. And Portugal is left out of the negotiations. Salazar doesn't even want to be in the negotiations uh, for NATO. But then, because of the Azores, Portugal is invited, and they drag their feet. So there's a lot of, um, of, uh, of reluctance on the part of Salazar. There's divisions in the, in the Council of Ministers. There's divisions uh, in the military about whether or not to go into NATO as a founding, as a founding member. Because a lot of um, decision makers in Portugal wanted to hew close to Spain. So it was this idea that Portugal and Spain together could resist uh, American liberal influences. And um, Spain is not going to be in NATO for, for a lot of reasons. Uh, they're not going to, to invite Spain uh, in 49. And Salazar insists that Portugal has to go in with Spain. But when push comes to shove, He's got to decide. He decides to to take Portugal uh, into NATO. So this is called by by a, a Cold War historian, uh, Westad, as the most curious addition to NATO, Portugal. So it's not at all obvious why a small state would be in NATO, other than the Azores. And after this, in the new Lages Agreement, which is from 1951, uh, Lages is so the the base. Uh, to which the Americans have, have, have access rights is integrated into the framework. So it's, 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 um, it's framed as being part of, of the NATO uh, effort. Then uh, despite the Azores, when John F. Kennedy comes into the US presidency, he takes a very dim view of Portuguese colonialism. So in the UN, there start to be a lot of votes against so condemning Portuguese uh, colonialism, there's uh, attempts to have Portugal try to draw up a plan to leave the colonies in the space of a few years. Of course, this doesn't work. Salazar isn't interested at all. And this causes a very, uh, very serious rift between Portugal and, and the US. 
So much so that the uh, agreement lapses for 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 Lajish base. So it's allowed to to go past the deadline, but the Americans stay, and so even without an agreement, kind of a gentleman's agreement, they still use um, Laj. Then finally, the thing that really, really uh, changes things is only in 1973, with the Yom Kippur War, so Arab-Israeli uh, conflict, where Israel is attacked by, 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 by surprise, by Egypt and, and Syria, and they're in very hot water. And the U.S. decide to have a, an airlift, so to supply the the to supply supply their ally Israel with um, with weapons with armaments, and the other allies aren't very much aren't very keen on on, on helping the U.S. And you need uh, to 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 transport very large cargo. You need a staging post. You need to 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 stop somewhere between the U.S. and Europe. So it's. Laj, it's uh, it's Laj that supports the majority of this airlift. This is Operation Nickelgrass, and in return, the U.S. promised a lot of uh, weapons to Portugal that Portugal wants to use in the colonial uh, wars. So, in the, in the independence wars, especially in in, in Guinea and Guinea-Bissau, so the U.S. are tacitly uh, agreeing with with um, or helping the Portuguese war effort in uh, in Africa against everything that's that's been happening during the, the 60s. And then what you have is the Carnation Revolution. So 74, big revolution in Portugal. Finally, uh, the Salazar regime, Salazar uh, had already died. This was now Marcel Caetan. It's over from uh, overnight. And this causes some embarrassment. The, the deal that had been made with the US in the Yom Kippur War, and Port Portugal refuses some of the weapons which still hadn't arrived and decolonizes. So uh, abandons its colonies. It's a very, very quick process. Um, so they're finally in line with the Western order that the US had started to create from, from 40, um, 40, 47, uh, 48, 49. But this is the, the, the important bit. Even though they were completely ideologically opposed to the liberal uh, world order, they still had to play along because of the Azores. Now, here you have uh, from uh, from uh, Butel Felix uh, a survey, an overview, just so you see that there's a lot of stuff going on during the Cold War in terms of um, facilities and functions. So you've got a lot of operational functions which take on a strategic um a strategic meaning to the us so this is a lot of this is intelligence gathering is anti-submarine warfare so keeping um an eye on submarine on soviet submarine activity in the north atlantic which was very intense nuclear powered sub, uh, nuclear armed submarines that the the soviet union had from which it could launch uh, a second strike. So if the US were to take out um, Soviet ground nuclear uh, weapons, they still had undetected submarines which were capable of striking the US with nuclear weapons. So it was very important for the US to detect these submarines. And Lajj and, and other uh, facilities, which you can see here, were very important for 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 this uh, for this effort, including uh, for for uh, surveillance uh, flights, which leave from which operate from Lajes with the P two Neptune and then the P three Orion and today with the P eight Orion. So, question is, and we're drawing to a close now. Question today, and now this is my thesis. I'm not going to give you a lot of detail here, but the question is. Are the Azores still relevant strategically after the Cold War? So as we've just seen, a lot happened during the Cold War. While this happened, a lot of tactical strategic functions also operated, um, hosted by, by, by the Azores. But what about the post-Cold War world? Well, it's very difficult to tell because the post-Cold War world is a very uh, VUCA world. 
So we saw the acronym from, from Yarger, volatility, uncertainty. Um, what's the C? I can't remember what the C is. Ambiguity and complexity. There's the C. So it's very difficult to understand the post-Cold War world because you have, for, for a few years, you have a US hyperpower. So you have a unipol rather than the US bipolar world. You have a, a US unipol. The US are in charge. And apparently the, the, the Azores, though they fulfill some logistical and, and surveillance functions, um, aren't that important because there's, there's very little in the way of security threats uh, to the US. However, very quickly, this starts to get a bit murky. And, you know, and, uh, you have uh, China rising as a strategic uh, rival to the US, Obama's Asian pivot. Then you have Russia again making trouble, 2014, the invasion of, of, of Crimea. So this all complicates uh, the narrative. Lajos does have a role in, in a lot of, um, of the major happenings of the, of the post-Cold War world, uh, namely the, the wars in, in Iraq and Afghanistan. Diplomatically, there's a very important uh, point, which is the uh, Lajos summit of 2003, where the US is very, very much short of allies to invade uh, Iraq and Portugal and Spain um, are, are one of the few who, who, who want to go along. And there's a summit uh, at Lajos with, with George Bush, where, where they, they, they declare their, their support. But lately, there's some stuff happening which seems to, to hint as, as a bridge role. So if during a part of, the, of World War II, the Azores were a frontier between the US and, and Europe, and you know, an increasingly Nazi-dominated Europe, then it becomes a bridge with Lajes, so thinking about, uh, about the post-Cold War world, how the US can uh, articulate between their means and their objectives in, um, in Europe and then in the greater Middle East. So uh, it's, it's all a bridge function. But now there's new kinds of bridge functions uh, appearing. So you have uh, the teleports in, in, in Santa Maria, where you have these uh, three uh, stations, one of them tracks um, satellite launches for the European uh, uh, Space Agency, the e ESA. You have the Galileo sensor station, which is for the Galileo navigation system, which is Europe's GPS. Uh, and you have the um, uh, meteorological satellite uh, data collection uh, station as well. There's been over the few the past few years there's been an attempt there's been an attempt to also launch satellites from Santa Maria and we're coming now to the um, to the crunch uh, point on this so they're trying to to there's been a, a legal tender uh, where they're trying to get a company to to do this this is going to happen this year or, or maybe not happen at all then also you have the air center which is what Miguel Mujardino calls a CERN, so CERN in Switzerland, a CERN in the Atlantic. So it's um, uh, an organization, international organization, which tries to have a collabor collaborative um, work in, in, in science. So oceanography, uh, earth observation, which, which is done uh, with satellite data as well. And this was established in 2018. Um, it's got its headquarters in uh, Tercera, in Tercera Island, and it's got a very extensive scientific network. So it's it's got scientists and institutions from a lot of countries, including the U.S., a lot of countries in the Atlantic basin. Basin, there's this idea that North Atlantic countries and South Atlantic countries should be involved, which is the same idea of the Atlantic Center, which is. Um, which is uh, fa facing security issues, so security threats to the Atlantic, trying to, to again, to, to have this uh, nexus between North and, and South Atlantic. 
And there's a joint statement, which was signed by 21 Atlantic Basin states, including uh, the, the, the US, tries to bring together experts uh, from the from from uh, the academy from from the university universities and also military to to think about security um, issues in the Atlantic, and then also you have uh, Lash. So we're just talking about security uh, threats that you still have. You have uh, Russia now very acutely uh, again, uh, also in the in the in the North Atlantic and with submarine activity again in the North Atlantic and the Arctic, and so there is still a role for 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 Laj, for Bazar's Laj. So to conclude very rapidly to try to 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 not I think I'm like two minutes uh, over time. It's both a frontier and a bridge, whether the Azores are a frontier or a bridge strategically depends on the strategic environment, mostly on the strategy of the dominant power of the Atlantic. And then there's how Portugal deals with this. So Salazar might have embraced the bridge function and, you know, when might have gone into the, the, the Western liberal uh, order um, fully fledged. He didn't do that. So he was always very reluctant. But because of the bridge function of the Azores, he got a lot of other strategic objectives like uh, Timor, like the, the like um, like uh, colonial empire being allowed to to to, to exist from letting the Americans use um, the Azores. So it also constrains uh, Portuguese foreign policy because would it have been possible for Salazar to say the Americans cannot have a presence uh, in the Azores, cannot use the Azores? Probably not. Probably there would have been an invasion uh, during the Cold War um, uh, of the Azores. Well, it's a what if scenario, but the incentives for the US to have a presence in the Azores are very, very uh, uh, large, which doesn't mean that Portugal cannot obtain uh, certain benefits, political and, and economic and military benefits, as it did uh, with the Azores. And then the question, post-Cold War and the future from, from now on, is it a frontier or is it a bridge? Perhaps there's some frontier functions vis-a-vis -vis Russia and the Arctic, Probably there's still bridge functions, and I think the Portuguese state is trying to 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 enhance the bridge functions. And that's it. I've got um, some some references here, which if you want, I can show you later. All right, I'm done. Sorry, Dinesh, for going like I think three minutes over time. No, no, no. This is great. You can go, you can go over time if you want to uh, a bit more. We have plenty of time. Um, and um, again, uh, I want to. Uh, uh, maybe if you could uh, to me unshare your your document so we can there yeah. you go okay um and so those of you following us here those of you following us on social media it's a bit harder to uh, get questions but I'll, I'll promise that i'll i'll look as uh, as i can but of course here on chat if you have any questions uh please do so I have a couple of questions uh, myself, um, uh, to me, and that is, of course, from your research and and you were kind of and you were very clear and, and congratulations, it's a great presentation. Um, we'd love to have you in the future in person at Fresno State. Let's see if we can work on that after you finish your PhD. Um, <clears throat> but uh, would would uh, it, it it seems very clear from your presentation, or maybe I'm reading too much into it, but it seems very clear from your presentation. And before I say that, one other thing, and that's congratulations on your English. It's perfect. It's better than mine. But congrats uh, on your, um, it, uh, it seems it's, it's pretty clear in your presentation that um, the Azores, a bridge or a frontier, um, it is the relationship uh, during that amount of time that you mentioned between the United States and Portugal would be totally different if it weren't for the Azores. I mean, any kind of conversations that, uh, as you've pointed out in that, you know, uh, the, pretty much the 20th century um, were, and the beginning of the 21st century, these conversations were had because of the Azores. The context would be totally different between the relationship between Portugal, the country of Portugal, if the Azores did not uh, did not uh, uh, happen to be where they're at, w what's your take on that? And and am I reading too much into it? 
No, I think you're you're absolutely right. So 100%. There's even if the Azores weren't as useful to the US, so uh, even and there's times when technology allows, uh, for example, uh, bombers, uh, aircraft couldn't cross the Atlantic on one go uh, previously. Then over the, the 50s, over the 1950s, they develop the, the, the autonomy. And then you have um, refueling in air. So you have um, uh, aircraft tankers that can refuel uh, other aircraft. So technology can um, diminish some functions at some times. It can also create other functions. So this fluctuates. But there's a red line, uh, if you like, where the US could not tolerate an adversary country being in the Azores. And I think this is, this is uh, a, like a, um, a floor for, for US-Portuguese uh, uh, relations because it's a very hard security question for, for the US. It's a very existential question to, to be able to have uh, that guarantee that the, the Atlantic is pacified. And you can see this in the, um, this was previously Great Britain's position. And you can see how Portuguese American relations before uh, World War I were, uh, and before World War II, so in the interwar period as well, Portuguese American relations were um, sometimes were made more difficult by Great Britain. So Portugal and Salazar did this. So even in, uh, in the negotiations we were talking about in 44 and 46, Salazar routinely goes behind the US's back to, to talk to uh, the, the British Foreign Office to, tr to see if the British are okay with this. Because in Salazar's mind, it's the British are still uh, the, the, the controlling power, the dominant power in the Atlantic. So. So you can see how the existence of the Azores triangula triangulates uh, the, um, the, the relationships that Port Portugal has with any transatlantic uh, power. Of course, after the Second World War, it's very clear that the British are not going to fulfill this role again. So it's just the US. But still, there's a lot of questions to, 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 to answer. And then also, so we're talking strategy, but then also, as you all know, and, and uh, you, you could sp uh, speak to this much more than I, there's also the cultural um, links. And the two things are very intertwined, very intertwined. From the beginning of the 20th century, you get uh, news, for example, you get uh, pieces in, in, in the US media, and you get writers writing about how the Azorians would prefer to be American. They would prefer to be annexed by the US or bought by the US because Portugal neglects them, doesn't uh, invest in their, in their uh, defense. So you have here a, a mixing of the cultural uh, links between the Azores and, and, uh, and the US and the strategic relevance of the Azores. And sometimes this worries Portugal very much. So this all also uh, plays into the bilat bilateral uh, relations of Portugal and, and, and the US. Indeed, I have uh, many other questions, but I know our time is limited, but uh, I'm gonna ask you one more. And this is kind of a, kind of a purely speculative in that aspect, in one aspect, and of course, um, you mentioned about JFK uh, and uh, Kennedy's uh, outtake uh, on colonialism. And of course, uh, indeed, uh, he was uh, uh, he was he 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 had a role in anti-colonialism in many aspects, as you know better than I do. But I, I'm kind of uh, uh, I'd love to see you know a study in the future um, about the role of the Portuguese American community in Massachusetts, who he had a. Uh, who he had a direct connection, uh, you know, vis-a-vis -vis the Azorian Refugee Act, um, and 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 it's always been, uh, you know, I'm not going to put everybody in one 
in 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 one bag but it's there there's elements there there are through the Portuguese press that I've read, there are elements in the Portuguese American community in Massachusetts and Rhode Island, but especially in Massachusetts, very progressive and very anti-colonialism and very, and I, 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 it would be interesting to see how much the role of the Portuguese American community and his relationship with that also played in some of his relationship with the country of Portugal when it came to colonialism. No, oh, absolutely. That that'd be uh, amazing to see. I'm probably not going to be the one to sure. to to do it because my pipeline is quite uh, is quite full. Um, yeah, I think that that that's um, a maybe very it's, maybe it's take. a good project There's, for a for a for a master thesis student yeah, yeah, yeah. here in, in, in the United a, States. Yeah, yeah, probably. Definitely. There's um, there's books on the diplomatic relations. So there's a book on Salazar and, and Kennedy, on their relationship. I'm not sure if there's something from from uh, the 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 point of view of the of the Portuguese uh, lobby and 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 JFK. Um, uh, JFK was very important for 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 the Azores, and I'm not sure correct, there's um, yeah yeah even It'd be after interesting the, to the look leash. into that in the future. How if that had any shape in you know. Yes, even while he was a senator, as you said, right, the, the, the Refugee Act. Correct, so correct. Maybe the Azores aren't uh, as thankful as they should be to, to, <laughs> to yeah, I think there, if there's any publishers uh, listening in, in, I think they should invite someone to write on this. <laughs> I, I agree, I agree. Um, there's two other questions. One is in Portuguese, and I'll try to translate it uh, for those who are following us who don't speak Portuguese and talking about the China issue, which is... Uh, um, and uh, so the question is, uh, what, and, and you can see it as well, uh, to me, which, uh, which is, you know, the the two days that the Prime Minister of China spent in Terceira in 2016. Um, and, uh, and does China have, of course, uh, uh, a strategic interest in the Azores? Uh, because of um, these two days that were spent by the Chinese prime minister. And to what point can, even if they have, I'll, that's my part now of the question, to what point, even if the Chinese are interested, can really the Portugal do anything because it's a founding member of NATO? Yes, very interesting question. Very interesting question. I think um, Chinese uh, interests in uh, in the Azores, and as the question uh, stated, uh, Xi Jinping visited uh, visited the Azores in twenty sixteen, if I'm not mistaken, twenty sixteen. Yes, twenty sixteen. And yeah, um, well, it's if if you if you if you think about that red line that I was I was just uh, speaking about, so about the idea that the U.S. cannot tolerate another power to to have um, a, a, an interest in uh, in the Azores, I think uh, this was um, there. There was a hope in Portugal that um, the U.S. would react to Chinese interest by you know. Reinvesting in the Azores by mm. by reengaging uh, in the Azores. So in 2012, Obama had announced the uh, downsizing. So the U.S. military military personnel would be reduced. The uh, Portuguese uh, civil civilian personnel would also be be reduced at at Lages. And I think this was quite a shock to to Portuguese uh, authorities. I don't think this was. Uh, in the cards for them, I think they thought that through diplomacy they could keep um, the, the 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 U.S. engaged. Of course, for the U.S., this was strategic. So Obama felt that he needed to readapt to uh, the, the the budget. The U.S. defense budget couldn't stretch enough for him to to pivot to Asia while also maintain his um, his interests uh, in, in in Europe. And I think the um, Chinese interest comes uh, as uh, in, in, in the uh, aftermath of this shock. So there's this idea that we can use this to maybe reverse the situation. Uh, yeah, I don't think this was realistic. So I don't think um, the, the, that the Azores could, um, could have any kind of sizable Chinese presence 
uh, either in terms of port infrastructure, you don't even need to, to go to, to a base. Um, however, you can get investment and uh, mm -hmm. China in, has invested a lot in Portugal. Mm -hmm. uh, it's got a big chunk of the Portuguese electric grid. Um, uh, it's a Chinese company and it's done this uh, all over Europe. It's part of the Belt and Road uh, Initiative. So Chinese influence was um, accrued through investment and European countries were happy to take um, to take the foreign direct investment to to to, to take the money, but now there's a, now it's a different story. Now I think there's a, a very clear sense that you need to make choices, and that the U.S. aren't going to allow you to 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 have your 5G uh, network uh, in uh, by Huawei, um, and because it's a strategic matter. So the the the, the question was. Uh, securitized, as 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 it's said in in security studies. So it went from being an economic question to a security question, and I, I think this for for the Azores. I mean, it's no, it, you, you cannot. I don't think you can play um, China against the U.S. in order to 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 get uh, stuff. What you can do, and fortunately, the the Portuguese state, I think, is 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 doing it, is that kind of stuff that I mentioned. So. Uh, uh, science diplomacy with the air center, um, security um, uh, collaboration with the Atlantic Center and satellite, stuff like that. So basically what you're saying, and you said there at the end, is kind of looking at the strategic and the relevance of the Azores. But, you know, sometimes we look at that and correct me if I'm wrong, uh, to my, but sometimes in the Portuguese uh, central powers, and even the regional powers, we still look with the same lens of the 20th century, like the Americans are going to come back, you know, 4,000 of them, you know, tomorrow morning. But we need to look with the 21st century lens. Definitely. So, so you need um, knowledge is power, right? Sure. And even during the Cold War, much of what was done in the Azores by, by, by the US was about um, knowledge, was about gathering information, gathering uh, intelligence, uh, surveillance. And if you can use the Azores as a place to convene uh, information and, 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 and knowledge um, uh, production, if you can do this, you can make the Azores strategically relevant uh, not through, not just um, through security, but as you say, uh, new questions that we have. For example, climate change. Correct. Scientific um, observations in the Azores are very important for 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 studying the oceans, which is you know ground zero for 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 climate change. And this is this is being done. If you can, and this is also being tried. If you can scale this up through international uh, cooperation and, and collaboration, you can bring stakeholders to the Azores. You can make countries into uh, uh, Azorian uh, stakeholders because the Azores are strategically relevant just by dint of its geography. Just for being there, they, they've got strategic relevance. But if you don't invest in, in the Azores, then that relevance, uh, as you say, it's it's going to come always from outside. It's going to come from someone who uses the Azores or from someone who doesn't want to use the Azores but doesn't want anyone else to use them, which was what Great Britain did during the uh, 19th century. So, yeah. Indeed. There's uh, one comment and one question to finalize. Uh, the comment is from a very good friend of mine, Dr. David Ross, uh, Professor Emeritus from Fresno State. And uh, David says that, uh, fine presentation, it is, I agree with him. Uh, and he has a detail, which is concerning the 62-63 difficulties in the U.S.-Portuguese relations. India, as we know, invaded and seized uh, Goa. And uh, he was in Lisbon at that time. He was very young, uh, but he was in Lisbon at that time as a as a foreign exchange student. Which was uh, which, uh, David. You need to write about that. You need to write about that experience of being in Lisbon. Uh, you know when this happened, because I I'm sure it was uh, you know front page in many ways. And the question um, is from Rodrigo Silva, which is what degree of relevance do you attribute uh, to the Azores for the French nuclear program? Uh, which indeed, uh, that was a time that uh, Azorians uh, were also very concerned.
Right. So regarding the uh, the comment, uh, yes, absolutely. So I think uh, Salazar from the beginning, so from from uh, Portugal didn't join the UN immediately, but it joined the UN uh, later. I think Salazar was very, very much invested in an idea of the UN as a forum where Portugal could defend its empire. So the idea that the UN is, is a, a forum where it's one state, one vote, right? So if Portugal is a pluricontinental state, uh, state and S Salazar's uh, government changed the, the, the nomenclature, so they changed the terms, it's no longer an empire, it's uh, an ultramarine state. So the, it's, it's provinces, it's not mm -hmm. uh, colonies, it's, it's, it's provinces. So this was an attempt to legally place Portugal in a place in the, in the UN uh, where, where it could, as it did, protest against um, the Indian invasion of our last remaining um, strongholds in, uh, in India. It, it didn't go well. Um, but, um, you know, if the, if the, the global uh, order, uh, that which was the UN, had, um, uh, had prevailed, maybe Salazar could, could have uh, scored, could, could have um, prevailed in, in defending uh, the Portuguese empire uh, uh, in this way. Sure. As it was, so... So the, the nothing could be done about the, the the Indian invasion. As it was, Portugal was the country who resisted the longest with a very sizable empire. So we lost Portugal, lost Brazil uh, very very early on, nineteenth century. Um, the the empire shifted to to Asia to to Africa, and the Azores play the role in allowing. Um, the, the empire to continue to exist in Africa. And, you know, these, you, you had terrible, tremendous civil wars um, in, in, in the African uh, colonies. And this, it played into the Cold War logic. You know, one side um, is going to arm one side, the other side is going to arm the other side. And it's, it's, only after the Carnation Revolution did you get this. Um, did you get this solved? So the other question was the other about, question was in the, the relevance. What uh, what degree of relevance? For the do French you nuclear program. Yeah, the nuclear program in the Azores. Uh, uh, the the so yeah. So my answer is, thank you for your question, and I'm going <laughs> to have a very good time researching about this because uh, I can't give you any uh, any any yeah. insights. It is, Thank you, Rodrigo. it is an interesting question. I think, I I think it's Rodrigo. something that needs to that needs yeah. to be looked into as well. And I know that there was some talk in the press, you know, when that was being developed, of course. But uh, I don't. Uh, yeah, interesting. Very interesting. Um, you had and, the the base the the base at Flores, right? Correct. So so you had from sixty four to uh, ninety three um, a French base at 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 Flores Island. Where you track um, missile uh, launches, um, and then what I know is that the U.S. has um, a lot of infrastructure to to detect uh, to detect the um, the development and testing of nuclear weapons uh, by 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 the Soviet Union, um, from Indeed. acoustics to 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 radio as well. Okay. We have well, more questions? And, and that's it. That does it. Okay. Well, thank you so much. Thanks for taking the extra time um, uh, to me. I appreciate it very, very much. Thanks to all of you who are joining us. Again, this is a product of the Portuguese Beyond Borders Institute. I want to thank FLAD, the Lose American Development Foundation, for their support, as always, and the California Portuguese American Coalition. And I'm very, very serious. We would love to have uh, to me uh, at uh, Fresno State. Uh, we actually are trying to convince the Azores, the government of the Azores and, and, and other funding agencies to have an ongoing, um, maybe not every semester, but every other semester, kind of a visiting professor in the limited perspective in like maybe a, a three or four week program where one could do uh, a series of talks, two or three talks in that amount of time and also do some research. So we'd love to have you here uh, because I think this is a fascinating uh, topic. I think the Azores 
um, uh, would be would be uh, you know there's lots and lots and lots more to 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 to, to research. There's actually uh, a thank you from Rodrigo when he says, uh, "How can we read your thesis soon?" Or hope we can read your thesis soon. Ah, so first I have to write it. <laughs> it's uh, it's uh, half written. Uh, I'm supposed to end it in September. I think I can I can I can manage it. Um, and if if there's interest, I'll I'll, I'll publish it. I'm sure there will be. I'm sure there will be. We uh, we at uh, the Portuguese Beyond Borders Institute uh, can be a partner. I can already tell you that if the, we're we're very interested in that kind of. Uh, so we can be a partner in publishing that if there's interest in Portugal as well. So thank you so much, Tume. Appreciate it. Thank you all for joining us. Thanks for those of you who are joining us on social media. On behalf of the Portuguese Beyond Border Institute from California State University, Fresno. Again, Tume Ribeiro Gomes, muito obrigado. Thank you so much. Fascinating presentation. Really, really brilliant. And appreciate all of you for joining us. Take care, everyone. Muito obrigado a todos. Muito boa noite. Boa tarde.